Ask her, I'll go to the basket. Well, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Fernando Villegas. Um, he will talk about BLET, a mathematical puzzle. Thank you. So, this is a puzzle that um, I worked on some many years ago with uh, two of my colleagues at the time in UT Austin, uh, Lorenzo Sadun and Felipe Voloch. And uh, if you are worried or uh, curious about the name, you see there uh, my daughter Malena is being thanked for providing the name. And it's a complicated story why that happened. This puzzle, uh, we were pleased with my colleagues at the time, made it to this uh, website, puzzles.com. Uh, and they even made this little logo, but anyway, um, what I'd like to tell you is some um, mathematics that's behind it. This was part of a course that I taught in Austin, where the, with the excuse of discussing various puzzles, um, I discussed some mathematics behind them. So this is one, probably the more sophisticated in the sense of what mathematics it involves. So let me um, first tell you what the puzzle is then. You start with um, a sequence of A, pairs A and B arranged in a circle. Say N is the number of A's and B's. Uh, going to be an even number. And um, this is the starting configuration. And there's uh, two rules that you can use. If you see a pattern of the form ABA, then you can change it to the pattern BAB. And conversely, if you see the pattern BAB, you can convert it to change it to the to the uh, to the a to a b a and the so this is the allowable moves and the goal is to maximize the number of a's or maximize the number of b's or maximize minimize either one because it's it's all very symmetrical. And there's a clear direction in which goes towards your goal. If you see a pattern of the form BAB, this has only one A. And if you change it by the pattern ABA, now you have two A's. So this direction is the, uh, is the greedy direction that um, will increase the number of A's. And uh, this puzzle, uh, I don't think or claim to be uh, particularly interesting in itself. I mean, and, and, I, and if the only interest it might have if you actually try it on your own a little bit and see what is behind it. But uh, unfortunately, then that would mean that I couldn't give the talk. So. I'll spoil the little fun there might be and, and tell you what, what's behind it myself. But uh, it's an illustration of this uh, problem that uh, greed is not the answer, typically. Because uh, if we have an implementation that I, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to show you right now, but so an implementation just to illustrate 
has n equals 28. So you, you click. So one way to think of this is that you can click on such a pattern on the B, and it converts it into this, or you click on this pattern on the A, and it gets you the other one. So that's an implementation of this idea. And if you're greedy, you only get uh, the number of A's to go to, make, to 21. But in fact, um, the maximum possible is 23. So this, uh, let me just say a, a little bit about the, the type of problem. Uh, OK, so first, first of all, I don't know if, you, if you've seen, um, you must have seen something like this. This is peg solitaire. And the, this is sort of a similar type of idea. So you can say that these puzzles are all involve replacing a pattern by another one following specific rules. So if you think of uh, peg solitaire, is um, if you have this A is now correspond to two pegs in blue and B a blank, so you can move this peg over to the blank and uh, take this uh, blue one in the middle out. So it goes from B A A B to B B A. But this in this puzzle, you only go in one direction. You can't go back. Once you do a move, you're done. You can't undo it. And, and here, the goal is also similar, is to minimize the number of A's, which would be the number of blue pegs. And in this game, you can actually achieve one. And it's one of those things that I played this when I was a kid, about 10, and I managed to be able to solve it. And then later on, I got interested in this type of uh, connection between mathematics and puzzles. And I even had a book. I mean, John Conway of Cambridge is famous uh, in many, many aspects. And one of them is, is interesting, this type of stuff. And uh, soon he wrote a really nice book, which I refused to read until I could solve the puzzle again. And I just never could. So I don't know. Um, progress it doesn't seem to always go with age. So in any case, the issue here is we have a space of possibilities. Yes? What is not allowed? You, you can only change this pattern to this one or backwards? In the other, in the other game, um, you, you only, uh, if I understand correctly, you just do the puzzles the way, the pegs the way I illustrated. Uh, if you have two blues with a space ahead, then you can move one peg over the other one and remove the one in the middle. That's all you can do. You can do it horizontally or vertically. And the idea is that every time you do this, you have one less peg, and you have to keep doing this. And the goal is to get to just one peg at the end, which, of course, you cannot take because there's no other move possible. And if you try this, you quickly find out that to get to one peg is not completely trivial at all. So the, the general picture here is that we have some kind of space of configurations uh, which is typically very big, even uh, something like this. Uh, I haven't been able to recall how many, I had computed how many of these configurations possible there were, but it's some big number of states. And we are sort of navigating through this to try to uh, minimize some functions. So we try to minimize a function on a discrete space. And that's a difficult problem. Uh, there's no calculus here to help us. So let me just say a little bit about uh, the question of minimizing discrete functions, which is, uh, again, I view this as an excuse to, to discuss this topic. Um, and when I first started with this puzzle, uh, I used this method to try to understand what was happening before 
uh, we eventually found with my colleagues a solution. So this is, uh, in a sense, unusual. Typically, if you have a problem of this kind, there wouldn't necessarily be a, a way to actually solve it completely, which is what we have in this case, which in a sense is the topic of the talk. But let me take a parenthesis and discuss very, very uh, superficially this question of maximizing, or let's say minimizing, a discrete function. By, what, by that I mean I have a large discrete set and some function on that set that we want to find a minimum value of. So to just schematically, let's think of the x variables which are um, the, the possibilities in our uh, space. I think of it just to do a graph as a one dimensional thing, but you should think of this as a, some big space. And then we have a function which uh, from the point of view of physics would be energy, so we'll call it E. And then the graph may look like this. And what we're trying to do is find the minimum values, or one minimum value, but let's say it's only one, so we're trying to reach this point by moving in this space. So we don't really have much uh, way to guide us as to you can't quite see and say, oh, oh there, this is the minimum, this is where we should be going. So let's say you start at some point, or maybe the point is given to you, and this is where you should start. And so what you could do is, uh, so schematically, let's think of the state that you're at, uh, x0 uh, here, then you make some move towards a neighboring point, which you could do perhaps randomly. And what you do is you compare the energy at the neighboring point and the energy at the point you were at. And if the energy at the neighboring point is smaller than the one you're at, then uh, you're happy because that's a better point, and so you take it. It's typical. This is one, up, one way to do it. And now the question becomes, what happens if you, if, um, let's see, if the, if the uh, point that you pick is actually worse? Well, if you are greedy, you always want to go down, and you will only take it in this case, and in this case, you just don't take it and try a new one. So what happens with that idea of greedy is that, for example, if you start here and you keep moving, then uh, you're going to get stuck at this point. So greedy uh, may result in uh, stuck at local minima. Well, uh, they, they, we, you take not a random point, but a neighboring point. The move, you think of it as, as something that is sort of nearby. Yeah. But even then, um, yeah, so yeah, you, should, you should think that the moves is something that takes you re reasonably close by. You do a small modification of your problem. Like here, you can have, you sort of think of this as a huge circle, and you do a tiny modification. Uh, you move to a neighboring configuration. So the idea that comes from, um, from physics um, is resulted in, in, in an algorithm in a, in a sort of vague sense, not, not too specific, uh, got the name of simulated annealing. So when you, annealing is a process where you take, a, say, a metal and you heat it to a high, high temperature and then you let it cool very, very slowly. Okay? And so the heating kind of frees the atoms to do whatever they want, and the cooling kind of lets them sit and arrange themselves in a better way than they were before you heated it up. Very, very uh, uh, simply explained. So you do something similar here, and the idea is, okay, we take it if we, if we are, have an advantage, 
But if we have a disadvantage that looks like this is a bad thing to be doing, you take it with a certain probability. So in a certain sense, you flip a coin, and you say, OK, look, this looks like a bad move, but I'll take it anyway. And so if you stuck at this local minima, then if you allow yourself to take some steps in the sort of wrong direction, maybe you will climb out of the local minima and fall in to the next one. And so this is a very uh, basic um, idea that uh, resulted in a very useful, very uh, interesting algorithms to minimize uh, discrete functions. So as I said, this is a, a tangent. It's not quite how we're going to um, discuss this puzzle, but uh, it was how um, I came up with uh, some ideas about it. So let me show you an example. So this is an example. So there is a probability, and the probability you can, the sophisticated way to think of uh, this is that the probability will change with the iterations. So you think of uh, a, um, a, a, of temperature as something that you have at your disposal in, this, in the sense of annealing. So if you have very uh, large temperature, then basically you take anything you like. You just go anywhere. And if you cool off, you then are becoming much more greedy. If the temperature was zero, you're totally greedy. And you let the temperature kind of slowly low, slow down. So at first, you basically move around randomly, completely, with any, no control, and then you slowly cool down. So this is an example of this. And here, the energy is measured. Let me just say that what you will want to see at the end are black and white strips, one next to each other. Because you measure whether the guys vertically are of the same color and the guys on the, on the sides are the opposite color. And so this wonderful simulation lets you do this. And there's a cooling rate, which is how is the temperature going to be slowly decreasing. So we're going to see in this graph global energy, this energy measure, then it should be going down. And we'll see the temperature starting at 1 and going down to 0. OK, well, we didn't quite get white, black, white, black strips. But for many purposes, that result is good enough. No, there's a probability involved in the temperature. So the temperature, there's a cooling rate here. Uh, let me see. The, this is a cooling rate, tells you how the temperature is going to change. And here's the temperature. We start at temperature 1. I haven't explained, but it basically measures how good your configuration is by measuring what your na vertical neighbors look like and how your horizontal neighbors look like. So, you, so if, if, you, if you were in exactly the position, all white and black strips, one next to each other, the, temp the energy would be zero. OK? So we are in that kind of picture with, with, a, me with a measure that, it, that the only solution to it is this black and white strips, one next to each other. OK? So um, it's, I, I don't know exactly. I, I don't want to get too much into it. But some, some sort of switching of, of the colors of the neighbors, some particular um, uh, exchange of, of white and black. Yeah, the, the radius is, is how, how around it are you supposed to? I think it's just a swap of, of black and white neighbors, a precise neighbors. I just wanted to show you the picture. I don't want to get too much into the specifics of this example. But anyway, let's write it again. So this clearly doesn't look like white and black strips. So we don't, we don't like this. Um, <coughs> and what looks like a reasonably small amount of iterations, it, it produces something that at least you probably can live with. 
Okay? And you see how the energy has uh, gone down to uh, what looks like it's not going to come down from that anymore. Yeah. Is what, sorry? Yeah, I mean, I, the talk is not about the system. It's just I wanted to just uh, use it as an excuse to bring this up. And uh, hopefully, it will entice you to, to explore it on your own. I mean, you probably can teach it, but others may have never seen it before. Um, so it's just that uh, I want to put the, the puzzle itself in, the, in a context. Uh, but what we're going to do now is something that sort of appeals, at least to me, um, mathematician of wanting uh, precise um, uh, answers that in this particular instance that I'm erasing, we have a way to understand this minimum uh, quite precisely. And that's really the topic of, of the talk. So what I'm going to do then is um, and try to understand this maximization problem in, in this Blet puzzle uh, by relating the, 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 the question to something else. So we started with this cycle of A's and B's. But le let me sort of cut it out and think of a string. And now, let's take W to be any string, any string or word in A and B. And I will associate to this a certain path in the plane. So this will be a polygonal path. in z squared, in the lattice. And this also somehow has to do with physics. And it was suggested to me by uh, Harold Skarki. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do is describe the motion by this. This a's and b's are going to be instructions for something to move in the plane. A part, I think of a particle moving in the plane. And There'll be two variables, and perversely, the physicists call Q the position, which I'll try to remember to use the right letters, and P the momentum. And there will be, uh, at any given time, there'll be two, um, two vectors that tell you where the particle is, and what would be the next thing it would do. And there's two ways that this will move. There'll be an A and a B will, will correspond to that. If we do an A, it will be to actually move one step in the direction of the momentum and keep the momentum as it is. And a B will be keep the position as it is, and change the momentum. I already messed this up. Keep the position as it is, and change the momentum by minus one unit of the position. OK? And so here's an implementation of this idea. Uh, I will start, my initial state would be that I start at the vector uh, 1, 0. I think I'll use uh, row vectors. So it's 1, 0. And the momentum is 0, 1. So you see the red arrow is the position, and the blue arrow is the momentum. So if I um, do an A, I just move in one, uh, one step in the direction of the blue arrow. If I now do a B, 
then I change my momentum vector by minus one unit of the position. Okay, so it was up here, and now it's, it was pointing up to here, and now it's pointing this way. So if I do A and B, and I repeat this, sorry. No, these are vectors. I have two vectors at every time, two, two, two dimensional vectors. And my moves are, um, for A, I change the red vector by one, by adding one blue vector. And in this case, I change the blue vector by subtracting one red vector. Well, they keep moving. Yeah. I start here and they'll be whatever they are. We'll, let, let, we'll explore and see what, what happens. So let me do um, A and B, and I'll iterate it. Except that I have to put it here. Okay, so this is what happens if you iterate A and B. Okay, let's try um, A, B, B. Let's see, I think maybe a, a, B. So let's just uh, get a sense of this. So somebody give me a string, a short string, and we'll iterate and see what we get. A, A, A. Well, you're never turning, right? You have to use a B. B is changing the velocity. So if you never turn, this will just keep going up. Okay, what else? Huh? B, A, B. Aha. So one more. Eh? A, A, B, B. That's, uh, yeah, A, A, B, B. Oops. So it's not always the case that this thing closes up. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> I'm going to come back to this. So, then associated to a um, sequence, a word in A and B, we have a path in the plane. So, what uh, we could do, so to keep track of what's happening, we let the matrix MK be the matrix where these are the rows. We start with M0 as the initial state as the identity matrix. And then doing A is nothing but multiplying by the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. And doing B, multiplying by the matrix 1, 0, minus 1, 1. So we can call these the, the state matrices. And the path that we see is the, well, we, the Qs are the positions. So if we look at our matrices, what we see are the, um, the first rows are the positions. But we also have the second rows, which are the momenta. And they move themselves in the, their own copy of Z squared. So let's do an example. Let me do this. So, um, for example, I can, we can get something with five vertices. Do A, 
B A B A A B A B A B B A B B A B Okay So So what we see is this. So these are what we're seeing here. The dots here correspond to the Q vectors, the positions. But there's a corresponding picture for the P's. And the P's uh, we can uh, read off by looking at the tangents. So um, if I start here, I mean, there's some ambiguity where I start, but say, let, let's say we start here. So the first vector is uh, 1, 0, or actually, they may, may start the same place. So we, the first vector is vertical. So I have a 1, a 0, 1 there. Then it's horizontal to the left, and you keep um, following this, and you see that this is the path that the P's do. So this is some path gamma, and this is some path we can call the dual, and they both come from projecting this path of matrices to the first row and the second row. Okay? And the key observation, first key observation that will allow us to understand this minimum on this game is to notice the following. If we look at the length of this path, by which I mean how many dots there are on the path, five, and I look at the length of the dual, there's seven, and seven plus five is 12, And uh, one of the theorems of math meta theories of mathematics is that all the 12s are the same. And in fact, any path they do will have the same statement. So any path that you construct out of following these rules will produce a dual path that has a number of uh, dots in it, which is complementary to 12 from the one you start. So what's this, what is the smallest path you can do? How many, is the smallest number of dots you could have? Two, four, it's three. Yeah? And the dual of this will have nine, which is the biggest you can have. So the dual will be, or you can get it this way. Oops. Already messed up. Let me try it one more time. No, it should have been an A, and then you get this big triangle. So this is a, a theorem that we proved with Bjorn Poonen. And maybe uh, Don will recognize this 12 of having to do with the delta function he just talk, spoke about a year, uh, about a half an hour ago. Uh, the proof that we gave of the statement is, in fact, using the delta function of Ramanujan, but the statement in general is the following. If you count the number of points on the path plus the number of points on the dual, you get 12 times 
the winding number of either one of them. So by the winding number, I mean how many times it goes around, which could be um, any, any integer. We, we're moving always counterclockwise. So what this amounts to is, uh, so what we see here, so let me, maybe you should write this pentagon again. Um, so it's A, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, B, A, B. Yeah? So the word in question is, in this example, is A, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, B, A, B. So if we look at the A's, those are exactly, the five of them, that's exactly the number of dots on the path gamma, and the number of B's is seven, is the number of points on the dual. Because every time you do an A, you change your position, and that creates one more dot in your path. And on, on the B side, if you um, use a B, you're creating, you're changing the momentum exactly by adding one more point. And so what this says is if you want something that close around only once, you'll, you'll have to use 12 letters. And so it's a theorem of uh, Scott. So what other properties, I mean, what kind of uh, properties does these paths that we see, they're not completely random things that we're seeing. So how would you characterize what these paths are that I get by playing this game, uh, this particular game, this A and B story, if they close? Say they close once. Hmm? What about the area? Well, it, what is a little misleading is this looks like we're talking about an Euclidean problem, but it's not an Euclidean problem. It's more a hyperbolic problem. And so things that are really the same in, in a certain, uh, have, will, have, will look very different. Because the group that we're using here is SL2Z, not, not, uh, not preserving uh, distances. So what, what the condition turns out to be is the gammas that we see contain a unique, only the origin as a lattice point. Sorry? Internal lattice point. And it turns out, this is a theorem of Scott, that if in any dimension, if you fix a, a polyhedron convex polyhedron with lattice points at the vertices, and you, you um, require that it has a certain number of, number of points inside, a positive number of points, then there's finally many possible such polytopes up to uh, the group of a change of variables. So um, let me show you what happens in the case of two dimensions. There's a 16 of them. And this is, um, these are all up to changes of coordinates, so they may look slightly different if you look, uh, if you do this yourself or you do, if you look somewhere else. But this is an example of, uh, uh, this, these are all distinct, I think up to SL2. And so these are all paths, all the paths that contain uh, exactly one interior point. And you see, uh, there's a guy here with nine, that's the biggest guy, and there's uh, the corresponding dual up in the top left corner, which is uh, the one that has exactly three points. So how do you prove this theorem? Well, I mean, for Wendy number one, you just check one by one. That's 
be a pretty silly proof. And that's what I, was my original proof, is just notice that this statement seems to always hold. Now, if you want to do this for a higher winding number, of course, then you have, there'll be finitely many for a given winding number, but that will not allow you to find a, a proof for all cases. And so, um, you'll have to do something else. And, and as I said, the proof that we have in the paper with Bjorn Punen uses the eta function of Dedekind. Okay, so this will turn out to be the key ingredient to uh, bound the maximum or the minimum number of A's and B's you can have in this game. So let me uh, sketch for you how that goes. So what is the key fact? Well, one other key fact, recall that we had those matrices A and B there. You can check for yourself very easily that the matrices um, A and B satisfy this. So what will happen is that the paths that you get by using this rule in the game will look different, but they will all lead to the same final state matrix. And so um, this will um, allow us to to get the bound that I'm going to tell you now. So, the theorem is the following then. Suppose that gamma, our path, is eventually closed, by which I mean that, as we were trying to do some examples in this uh, simulation, you have a string, and if you repeat it a certain number of times, it will give you a path that comes back exactly the same initial state. Both the momentum and the position are exactly the same. So this, as we saw an example, not always happens. And in fact, if you start typing randomly A's and B's in there, you will get paths that do not close. So suppose the gamma is eventually closed, then the number of A's, let's call LA the number of A's in the path, and the word that corresponds to the path, and L the total number of letters, is bounded above and below by 1, 6, and 5, 6. So this is for A, but this is all very symmetrical, so the same holds for B. So this will put a limit on the possible number of A's that you can have. Because the path that we have in our game is a path that is uh, eventually closed. So note, AB, AB, n times is eventually closed. because AB done six times, as we saw, is closed. That gives you a hexagon. Yeah, so let's do it again. So we do um, AB, well, let's iterate this uh, six times. Okay, so the pair AB repeated six times is closed. So the pair AB is eventually closed. And so the pair AB to the N, or the N over two, uh, rather, if I do this six times, this is the same as AB to the six, N over two times, and AB to the six is closed. So the path that we're talking about is closed, uh, is eventually closed. So it, it will, this statement will apply, and it limits how many A's or B's you can have. B 
because um, any modification by the rule of the game, as I said, will change the path itself, but it won't change the fact that it is eventually closed because the endpoint remains the same. Okay, so let's, let's see how we uh, can prove that. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me, let me first prove this. Well, the final state matrix. A word is a series of instructions, so if you follow all of them, there's a final state. Yeah? So let me sketch the proof of this. Which is, uh, I like because it, it uses the geometry of this path. I mean, a priori we start with the game, which seemed like a completely uh, discrete thing, not connected to anything else. But with this uh, path business, now it becomes something we can use some elementary geometry for. So the first observation, so let's, let's, say, uh, uh, let's say that gamma itself is closed. The idea then will be more or less the same. And um, let V1 to VR be the vertices. Okay, by vertex, I mean a corner. So in this case, there's a six, but uh, we saw squares and other things. So the number of vertices um, is not the same as the number of A's or B's. In fact, what is a corner? A corner in this path is a place where, instead of moving forward, we decided to change the momentum. So it has to correspond to a B, at least one B. So in fact, the vertices correspond exactly to blocks of Bs. Okay. And now let's look at the vertex. So we're coming in from here, coming out there. And let's define the exterior angle to be the angle here. And one uh, small thing to convince yourself is that the sum of these angles is equal to what? Well, if we went around one time, it would be 2 pi. If we went twice, it would be 2 pi times 2, and so on. It's 2 pi, uh, 2 pi times the winding number. But by this theorem that I erased, the winding number is the number of a's plus the number of b's divided by 12. So that means that this is pi times the length over 6. And on the other hand, the number, this thetas, each angle is at most pi, and each vertex corresponds to blocks of b's, and each block of B has to have at least a B. So this is uh, majorized by pi LB. So we get that um, yeah, so it's strictly bigger. So we get that LB over L is bigger than 1, 6. And now we do this symmetrically with, this, with the A's, and you get that is less than 5, 6. So it's a, just a quick idea. But, but the key thing is to use the geometry of this path to understand how many possible uh, B's in this uh, setting there can be, because the B's correspond to vertices and vertices uh, are where you turn, and so there's an angle involved, and there's a limitation for those angles. 
anyway, I understand it's quicker than it could have been, but I want to get to, to the final point. So what I was saying before about being eventually closed is that, um, so let me use a little notation. So we have a word consisting of uh, A's and B's. So a word in, in uh, A, A and B. And we can, uh, let me define rho of W to be the uh, state matrix at the end. So if I were to do it in that thing, I will look at the string and click as many times as these letters indicate, and at the end I'll be somewhere with some red vector, some blue vector. That's my state matrix M. Excuse me? Yes, that's what I do, yes, and then take the product. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just look at the string and now replace, as Don says, the letters by the matrices, and that's take the product of all of those, and that's M, indeed. And so the point is that the, this thing is the identity, and there's a little bit of work to do, but um, I think I'll skip it, that if you modify, so let's say W prime is a modification of W by the games rule, then if one of them uh, is eventually closed, then so is the other. So in the initial word W consists of A, B, A, B, A, B, that's eventually closed, and so the theorem applies. And because of this statement, every other sequence that comes from having done a modification to the original uh, game starting point is also eventually closed. And therefore, the theorem applies for it. Sorry? Yes, in fact it is, yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's maybe even better, clearly. Okay. Just because the matrices themselves satisfy the, the rules of the game. So in a certain sense, if you think back to the original question, I mean, you can take this puzzle as being, okay, there's some configurations of that you're allowed to change by another one, and you can imagine zillions of puzzles of this kind. And this one happens to be analyzable in this form because this replacement rule is exactly something that is, uh, has, is very tied to this particular geometry of this group. And um, just, I want to say just a couple last things. Um, what is the geometric meaning of doing the rule? Well, let's just do a small, the justice case ABA itself. So we go up, then we turn, and then we go. So an AB portion, if we started from the beginning, would look like this. And the corresponding um, replacement, ABA, ABAB, will be we first turn, then we move, and then we turn again. So what happens is, in general, what you'll see is that One of the paths, W, might have a piece like this, and W prime will have be replaced by that. So one way to interpret what this rule of the game is, is that in the path, you can chop off a corner. But the corner has to be such that there is no other lattice point involved. And so I'll, I'll finish with this example. Should have uh, done something with this. So, um, 
Let's do A, B, B, A, B, 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 A, B, A, B, A. So here's a, an example. And um, if we look just at the, at the path, there's only one corner we can chop off, which is down here. Every other corner will necessarily have, is, it, it either goes through the middle or something's wrong. Yeah, that's all there is. The, the, there's no other corner we can chop off without sort of including one extra lattice point. And if we look at the at this uh, at the string here, there's only one string a b a that we can actually change to a b a b, which is right here at the bottom. So, no, there should be only one. Is it? Where? They can last. No, this one you cannot join to that one. To, no, but that's just a segment. No, I think, I think this is only one. So let me uh, do this. Let me uh, replace the ABA by BAB. Now run it again. And we get the same thing with the corner chopped off. So if you look at these pictures, what this, the greedy algorithm will be to always chop corners off. What we would like to do is to get this to be as small as possible. And what we found, well, maybe in, in the case of only one turn, there's so few things that you don't really see it. But if you have more, you will not be able to chop it off to the smallest possible way by just always chopping in corners. Sometimes you have to add a corner, which would be the inverse of this, uh, and to, to cut a corner somewhere else. So, um, yeah, so this was uh, this puzzle that I wanted to discuss, uh, which I kind of think of it as a puzzle with a moral. The greed doesn't always. You should not have? You should not cut corners, good point. But, or you should cut the good corners. And uh, greed uh, may not always lead you to what you want. So, thank you. Thank you.